Chapter 14. Come on, Fab, step up your hair game. You gotta actually look fabulous for people to start calling you fabulous, Donna says, standing in front of me with one of her wigs. I'm sitting on Chantal's bed as Donna tries to put that hairy thing on me and make my face look plastic again. I keep both my hands on top of my hair and shake my head like a toddler. No. It's another Saturday night of us getting ready, but this time, I'm the only one going out. By myself. With Kasim. A date. A real date. I've been thinking about my mother all day. Would she approve? Would she like Kasim? Would she like what I was wearing? I don't even know if she would like me wearing wigs or weaves, as Donna calls them, because I never so much had, much as had braid extensions. Both me and Maman have managed just fine with our own hair, like Chantal and Pri. My phone buzzes and I quickly grab it. It's Detective Stevens, and she texts that she'll be calling me at 3 o'clock tomorrow. Maybe I will tell her about Kasim, and maybe I will have some information for her. But I shake that thought from my mind, because tonight I don't want to have any worries. Who is that, Kasim? Donna asks. I think he'll like you more with just a little more hair on your head. I just nod. That's not true. You don't have to wear any of Donna's fake hair, Fab, Chantal says. She's spread out next to me on her bed, reading a textbook. She's trying to make you look like her real twin. I heard that, Pri says. I stand up to look in the mirror. When I try to gather my thick braids up on top of my head, it's a mess. Come here, Chantal says, placing her laptop on her dresser. She punches a few keys, and soon we're on YouTube, watching a girl do her hair while giving instructions. Oh, Lord, Donna sighs. Sean has been on this natural hair shit now, and she's going to try to make you look like Sasquatch. She plops down on the bed. The girl in the video has thick hair like mine, and she pats it down with white cream from a jar that she displays on the screen. Then she parts and rolls and twists her hair into a fancy style. Chantal helps me do the same to my braids. When we're done, my hair looks so good that I could eat it. It's sculpted like a crown. I look like a goddess, like Azili herself, the Loa of beauty. Great, Donna sighs. Now you look like Rosa Parks. Let's at least do your face so you look like Nicki Minaj. No, I say, shaking my head. No makeup. Damn it, Chantal, Donna says. There you go. You got your own twin now. She grabs her makeup box and wigs and leaves the room. I don't know if she was joking or really angry that I liked the hairstyle. Ha ha, you lost, Pri tells her. Chantal and her corny librarian hairdo won. I only add lip gloss to my face. I lick my fingers and smooth down my eyebrows like my mother has done for me so many times. I look clean and decent, but now I have to find a good outfit to match my new hair. I search my mother's suitcase for one of her dresses, a red one with tiny flowers. It reaches to the middle of my calves, but otherwise it fits perfectly. Oh no, Pri says. Don't tell me you're wearing that. Girls will jump you for going out with fine-ass Kasim and looking like a church lady. Leave her alone, Chantal says. You look cute. Cute, Pri snorts under her breath. As long as it helps you keep them legs closed and hold out for a long time. I mean, a long-ass time. But I don't want to look like a church lady. I want to. I still want to look good. So I take off my mother's church dress and put on a plain sweatshirt that belongs to Chantal and a pair of new jeans. I wear the Air Jordans that Pri picked out for me, but I keep my hairstyle. So I don't look, so, now I don't look so Haitian, so immigrant. I fix my face in the mirror again to make me look serious, almost like Chantal's, a little bit like Pri's with a touch of Donna. Okay, that's better, I guess, Chantal says. Where is he taking you anyway? I don't know. Well, if it's to his house, ask him to bring you back here right away. And if it's to someone else's house, Pri adds, tell him, take me the fuck home. Say it just like that. Let me hear you. I know she's tricking me just as so she can make fun of my accent and make me sound stupid. My curses are all wrong. My swag, as they call it, is off. But in my head, I sound just like them. I sound American. I fix my lips and make a face until it feels just like Pri's. And I say, take me the fuck home. Both my cousins burst into laughter. Even Donna comes into the room just to drop her body onto Chantal's, hold her belly, and laugh from a deep, joyful place. I look into the mirror and watch myself say those words over and over again. And each time, my cousins laugh harder. Yo, Fab, it's fuck, not fork, Pre manages to say between laughs. When the doorbell rings, we all look out the window to see Dre's white car parked at the curb. Donna runs down to open the door, and she calls my name. It's Kasim. He's driving Dre's car to take me on our date.
Kasim has flowers and he's dressed in a nice black coat, black pants and shiny black shoes. His hair is shorter and neater and he's wearing glasses. He looks really good, but that car makes my insides feel like a hurricane. I don't want to get in, but I don't have a choice. He must have seen me staring because he says, Dre told me I could use it. He likes you. He thinks we look good together. He rushes to open the passenger side door. I look toward the corner where bad leg usually sits. There's no one there. Not even the streetlight shines. The plastic bucket is gone. I turn to the house to see my cousin's face, faces pressed against the top floor window. Is it okay, Donna, if I sit here? I call out nice and loud. She gives me the middle finger. I slide onto the leather seat and it smells like lemons. I sniff and sniff, searching the air for some remnant of Dre and his bitter mint and sweet smoke smell, marijuana. But there's nothing but lemons. Oh, I got it cleaned before I came here, Kasim says as he presses the button that starts the car. I know it's not mine and all, so I wanted it to have a different smell, a different feel. All right with you? I smile and nod. He turns on the radio and I brace myself for that heavy bass music. But it's something different. Something like jazz, but still hip hop. I look at him. He looks at me and smiles. I start moving to the beat a little. He does the same and turns up the volume. The rapper's voice is smooth, as if he's reciting love poems. I've never heard anything like it, and a chill travels up my back, making me smile wider than I probably have in a long time. You like that, he asks. I nod. Jay Dilla, Detroit legend. He died when I was little. I'm into the classics, but all Detroit all day. Motown, Jay Dilla, Slum Village. He pulls the car away from the curb, and his voice blends well with the music, as if he's a background rapper for this Jay Dilla. What about Eminem, I ask. Kasim laughs. Slim Shady? What'd you do, watch 8 Mile before you got here? You need to upgrade your info, Miss Fabulous. You heard of Big Sean? He presses some buttons near the dashboard and the music changes. It's something familiar I've heard on the radio in Chantal's car. Kasim raises the volume and he dances while slowly turning down the corner of Joy Road. And there is Papa Legba, leaning on his cane with a cigar in his mouth and looking straight into the car with his gleaming white eyes. My skin crawls, and suddenly what was just a smooth hip-hop song now sounds like heavy conga drums, a downbeat rhythm, like for the Petuo Luaz, the fiery spirit signaling danger ahead. My stomach twists into a knot, and I almost want to tell Kasim to stop the car and let me out. But he reaches over and eases his hand into my hand as we drive past Bad Leg, and my stomach settles, my thoughts calm, and we stay like that for the whole ride down Joy Road until we reach the highway. Then he drives into downtown, toward Broadway Street, where we reach a wide, brightly lit, tall building that's just for cars. We park Dre's car, then walk in the same direction as the other people coming out of nice cars and wearing fancy coats and high heel shoes. I look over at Kasim and down to my own clothes and begin to feel very underdressed for whatever this surprise date will be. We get in line for a theater called the Detroit Opera House. A poster near the entrance has a photo of a lean, muscular, dancing black couple and the name Alvin Ailey. It's a dance performance. Within seconds, everything from the past few weeks that has caused me so much worry melts like ice in the sun. I'm guessing you like dance, seeing how you was trying to do the Detroit jit back at that party, Kasim says, easing closer to me as the line moves. I nod because I'm speechless. I've seen line dan live dancers before at folklore festivals in Port-au-Prince, and Le Caille, and at parties where Haitians dance to compa as if they're on Dancing with the Stars. But never anyone like the ones on that poster, with legs and arms as long as the sky stretches. And never with such people for an audience, all black people with their faces smiling bright, the sounds of their voices all around us like music. It's as if I'm mingling with the bourgeois business people and entertainers from P Pichonville. I keep my eyes on one beautiful couple where the woman's hair sits high and round on top of her head like Jesus's halo. She and her man hold hands and kiss and talk and kiss some more. My eyes are so fixed on them that I jump when Kasim puts his arm around me. Then I realize that we are not as beautiful. I am not as beautiful as that woman. I remember what I have on, jeans, a plain sweatshirt, sneakers, and Pri's oversized coat. I gasp and cross my arms across my chest. Kasim, I can't go in there like this, I whisper. You didn't tell me I had to dress up. He looks down at me. You look good. You got on your Jordan some nice tight jeans. If anybody look at you funny, you tell them you rep in the west side. I roll my eyes. I'm serious. This is a nice event, and I could have worn something nice. You have on good clothes. 
That's because I was trying to impress you, not them. I want to show you that I could be bougie too, remember? Do some bougie shit with my bougie girl. Kasim, I look away from him because I want to go home and change. Hey, he turns me around and gets really close to my face. All that matters is that you're bougie on the inside. You could be from poor ass Haiti or live in a trailer park, but as long as you have a bougie heart, you can aim for the finer things in life. He makes his face look very serious as if he's a professor. His glasses slide to the tip of his nose and he looks out at me from the top of the frames. I laugh and lean into him. He pulls me in and wraps his arms around me. He holds me tighter and kisses the top of my head. I sniff his shirt, then lift my head to take in the bare skin of his neck. It's a mix of sweetness and too strong cologne. I only move because we're at the front of the line and we have to go inside. When he hands over the two tickets to the usher, I see that they cost over $100 each. I forget every single thing in the world, every heartache, every tear, every pain as I watch that performance. The dancers, the music, the lights, the people in the theater are all so beautiful that I want to wear them on my skin for the rest of my life. And Mama, if only I can wrap everything that I'm experiencing and place it in a box as a gift for her. I would put it into the box, the dancers and into the box, I would put into the box the dancers and music and the whole theater as if they are perfectly wrapped clothes and jewelry. I must bring her here when she comes. How much were the tickets? I asked Kasim as we we're walking back to the car. Excuse me, that's not a polite question, Miss Fabulous. I don't want you to spend so much money on me. You have your mother, that shitty car, and don't you want to go back to school? That's what you said. He laughs a little. I think it's so cute the way you say shitty. Kasim? All right. He stops in front of Dre's car. I'm not a baller, fabulous, but you're different from a lot of these other girls out here. I mean, they might make fun of how you talk and all, but you are more bougie than a whole lot of these girls. And by bougie, I mean classy shit. Like going to the theater instead of the movies. My uncle taught me that. To be honest, I got the tickets from him. I pull the co coat's hood up over my head because the wind is getting colder and stronger. The headlights from other people's cars are like the lights on the stage, making everything bright and then dark over and over again. Your uncle seems like a nice man. Yeah, well, Q is not my real uncle. He's Dre's uncle, but it's like he's everybody's uncle. Shit, he might even be your uncle. He opens the car door for me as I let his last words settle in my bones. My uncle? I ask when he gets in the car. Yeah, Uncle Q. He owns Q over there on West Chicago. That's his club, practically his block. That's where he runs his business. And that's where I first fell in love. He turned to me and smiled extra wide, showing his teeth. Why would he be my uncle, too? I had an uncle, my cousin's father. Oh, yeah, the legendary Haitian Phil. What? Pri won't ever let anybody forget her father. She's always swearing on his grave right before she gets to stomping on some girl's face. I swear on my father's grave this. I swear on my father's grave that. And whoever be working for Uncle Q, she won't ever let them forget that it was her father, Haitian Phil, who went down for Q. What? Went down for Q? I ask again. This time, I'm staring at him with my eyes wide and my ears even wider. Damn, fabulous. Your cousins don't tell you shit. Good. Stay out of it. West Side Logic, Detroit politics, as I like to say. I don't fuck with any of that shit, and neither should you. Maybe this is Papa Legba's doing, making Kasim talk more than he should, teaching me about Dre and Q and Uncle Phil. Suddenly, I feel caught up in something bigger than myself. If he can tell me what I need to know about Dre... Maybe Kasim will finally be the key that will help me pull my mother through to this side. I don't ask any more questions. Instead, right before Kasim pushes the button to start the car, I pull on the sleeve of his coat, lean over, and kiss him on the cheek. He turns to me, and I kiss him on the lips. Then he turns his whole body to me, takes my face with both his hands, and kisses me long and deep. When we drive back to American Street, all the lights look brighter. Maybe there are more stars in the sky. And this city is more beautiful than it has ever been.